Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, I'm honored to have Carrie Green on the show. Carrie served as a pastor for 20 years in small churches, and he sensed that it was the time for him to leave the ministry. He discovered his entrepreneurial bent, which is very interesting. He's the founder and client and the client happiness guy at Podcast Fast Track, a full service podcasting company. Carrie is married to his best friend since 1989, has five kids, a daughter in law and a son in law, three grand boys, a black lab named Joy, and he travels the United States in a 39 foot RV named Roland. Welcome to the show, Kerry. Glad to have you on. So glad to be here. Thank you for the invite. Give us your story. Tell us how you've led such an interesting life. I mean, to be in the ministry and then do a 360 and hit the entrepreneurial trail is not very common. No, I don't. I don't think it is a path that many people walk. I grew up in a kind of a blue collar home in the panhandle of Texas near Amarillo, Texas, if you know where that is. Mule um, Chew. Was it Mule Chew? No, that's actually where my mother lived for years was near <laughs> Mule Chew. But I actually grew up in a town called Pampa. It's uh-huh. northeast of Amarillo, about an hour. And just my dad was a hard working man. I worked at a, a company outside of town called Ingersoll Rand that built oil field products and all kinds of things now that they've diversified into. But I just learned to be honest and work hard. That's mainly what my parents taught us. And my mother took us to church. I learned about God there and had lessons in faith as I was growing up. And somewhere around my sophomore, junior year of college, felt that it was a calling on me to go into ministry. So I started out in youth ministry and moved to an associate pastor role. And then finally into some teaching pastor roles at various churches around the country. And that was kind of a, a short nutshell version of the 20 years that we were in ministry I married my wife right before all of that happened. And we had those five kids in that time, but it was back in 2013 when I was just sensing that that season was up. And it was one of those things where I really feel that the role of pastor is one your heart has to be entirely in. And if it's not, the people are getting shortchanged that you're supposed to be serving. And so I, prayed through it a lot. And my wife and I talked about it a lot and we just felt it was time for us to go. And so I didn't even have a plan B. I just knew that this isn't where I was supposed to be. So I let the church family know, I feel like I can give this six more months to help you make a transition, but I really need to step out. It's just, it's just not the right fit anymore. And I'm telling you, Art, in that time, I was so scared. I didn't know what we were going to do had no jobs, no prospects, was doing a little bit of work online, but not much, and discovered that I I enjoyed audio editing and I enjoyed writing summaries of podcasts and things like that. So that's where the idea for Podcast Fast Track came from. And it, it really was created through an act of desperation because I had to put food on the table. I had to pay the bills. And I didn't want to leave the beautiful mountain town where we lived at the time. And my wife didn't either. So I had to figure out a way to make that, that business work. And so that's the long story short. It really has been a crazy journey, but a fun one. And I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah, I really love it when people walk out of things in faith mm. and just move in faith. Because I think it says a lot about what your psychology is. Uh, I think I told you that expectations are my field, and we see them in two two lenses, through two lenses, either faith or fear. Mm. Faith moves us through everything. When you have unconditional faith in what God has planned for you, you can move mountains. Yeah. If you let fear get you, it stops you every time. The devil just walks in and stops everything from happening. And, and his flow, his essence moving through you, how, whatever you want to call it, you know, his power moving through you. Yeah. When I interview people, a lot of people explain the tragedies in their life, 
But those tragedies have become stepping stones of mm -hmm. their growth. Yeah. And it moves us in areas that make us so uncomfortable, but yet the outcomes when you have faith are so bountiful. It's so gracious and loving. Yeah. Yeah. Kind. I've definitely discovered that God usually doesn't grow us uh, when things are comfortable as much as he does when things are uncomfortable. And that was a season of a lot of discomfort. And I was forced into roles and, and experiences I never thought I would be in. Yeah. But, but as I mentioned, I would never go back. Yeah, I think that says a lot about how faith works. Mm -hmm. I think that faith is so important. I speak out in public. I talk a lot about faith not always being in a religious sense. For me, faith is my faith in God and, and Jesus Christ is my Savior. But I understand, and God has spoken to me about this, about everybody that isn't Art Costello. Everybody mm -hmm. isn't Kerry Green, and we have different views. And he wants us to, to minister to those people who don't have the religious sense of faith. And we can do that sometimes by explaining that faith is just the ability to see beyond what is known. Mm -hmm. And that oftentimes leads me into being able to help people into a religious faith. Does that resonate with you at all? Or Yeah, there's often people who you have the opportunity to talk with who are undergoing a difficult situation or asking that question we all ask at times, you know, why? Why is this happening to me? And pointing them toward a reality that's bigger than them, that there is a God and he has a good plan for them is always rewarding. And it's a, a, a thing that people come to understand in different ways. They don't necessarily resonate with every phrase you say or every religious sentiment you might express. But I trust that God's bigger than that. And he's able to guide them in a way that they understand to really grasp the things of God that are there behind the surface. Mm -hmm. When you were in the ministry and towards the end of it, was it because you were getting that you weren't satisfied with it and that you felt that you could do more outside of the ministry than you were actually doing inside the ministry? No, that wasn't really my story. I think for me, it, it manifested itself in, in kind of just weariness, a sense of, of just not having any more gas in the tank is really kind of how it felt. And that the, the church was still something I loved. The people were still people I cared about. Uh, all of that was the same. But just the level of energy that I had to continue in that role just wasn't there anymore. I tell my wife uh, quite often because I still teach, biblically speaking, uh, quite a bit. I speak at local churches when I have the opportunity and I, I do a daily five-minute morning devotional kind of a podcast that I do teaching in. So I still love God's Word and I still love to teach. But that heart for shepherding a group of people and for being in it with them in the thick and the thin uh, day after day after day is kind of what disappeared. Yeah. And it's not that I don't care about them. It's just that I don't feel I'm called to that anymore. And for me, that's an important thing. Yeah, I can understand that, how it really is at the core of your, your expectations and all the things that you live for. So yeah. I, I do understand it. Do you have any thoughts about some of the, coming from a, a North Texas background, some of the mega churches that are out there now, do you, what are your thoughts on some of those mega churches and, and the lifestyles of the pastors? Because I know as a small church pastor, you don't, the, the rewards monetarily are nothing like what they are in, in those mega churches. Any yeah. thoughts? You know, it, yeah. Oh, gosh. You, you don't want to get me started on this one, Art. Um, there's a lot I could say. Let me just say this, to be as gracious as I can. I think every situation is going to be a little different depending on the man or the, the pastor that's in that role. I think that mega churches, for as far as they go, are not a bad thing in and of themselves. I think that there's great work that's happening in many of them. But I've come to believe that growth really happens in smaller groups more than it does in larger groups because you're able to develop relationship and intimacy with people who can truly pour into your life and you can pour back into theirs, hold you accountable, you can hold them accountable. 
be there when tragedy strikes and a shoulder is needed to cry on. I mean, that happens in smaller contexts, not in a large, massive meeting, typically. And so my model of what the church should look like has changed a lot over the years. And as far as pastor lifestyles and things like that, I'm all for paying pastors well. I think for the amount of work they put in and the kinds of burdens they have to carry, they are some of the most underpaid people on the planet, right next to elementary school teachers and junior high school teachers. But having said that, I do think there's a place where it becomes uh, too much and it becomes extravagant. And that line is a hard one to walk. And it's one that I think the people who are in charge, the elders or the, the deacon board or whatever the church polity has in place, have to be wise about that. They have to know when is lack of income distraction for the pastor. And so therefore we need to give him a little more in his paycheck. And when is too much income a distraction for the pastor? And we need to find that balance. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. A lot of people are very adverse to some of the lifestyles and some of the the surroundings that have come with some of the mega churches. And I and I really have a very interesting story about mega churches. And this is solely how God has worked in my life. I have been at the root of probably some of the biggest mega churches movements in the history of organized religion. To give you an example, mm. in 1968, when I, or 66, when I came home from Vietnam, got out of the Marine Corps in 68, but, and started going to college in Costa Mesa, California, and that's where Calvary Chapel was created by yeah, Chuck, absolutely. Smith, Chuck Smith, and mm-hmm. he was in a tent, and I became involved in the church there. I had just gotten married, and my wife and I went to church and they said they were going to do a baptismal at the Pacific Ocean in Newport Beach. And we walked down there and there was 4,000 people there to be baptized. Wow. Wow. 4,000 people. Hmm. And we were on the front row. Chuck Smith walked up to my wife and I, took us by the hand and baptized us first. Hmm. And it was just, it was, it was just how my life goes. We stayed there a few years. I went to San Diego State, and we decided to start going to a small church. It was about 100 people going to it, and the pastor's name was John Maxwell. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we started going there, and I taught ch- Sunday school, went up to Fullerton, California after I graduated. And started, yeah, I know where this is going. Yeah. yeah. And, a, and a friend of mine said, hey, there's a beautiful little chapel in Fullerton, California, and you need to go over there. And here this pastor, he's incredible. Chuck Swindoll started teaching Sunday yeah. school with him. Went another church in Garden Grove with uh, Reverend Schuler. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. wasn't, that wasn't as early. That was after. But I mean, I've just been surrounded by some of the greatest pastors. Uh, but Chuck Swindoll was an incredible teacher. And Chuck oh, yeah. Smith was an incredible teacher. And yeah, they laid great communicators. John Maxwell, great leadership. Sure coach and all that. So I've just been blessed with having some of those people in my life, you know? Yeah, that is a blessing. Yeah. It was really interesting. I never thought about it at the time, you know, it's now being older and, and later in life, I can't, I think, wow, God was working in my life in big ways, really. So yeah, Yeah, for sure. Really, really interesting. So after you left the ministry and started doing the entrepreneurial edge to it. Can you give us some feedback on that, how how it went and the struggles that you had there and what creative yeah. things you and, did? And- yeah, well, I discovered, as you mentioned, an entrepreneurial band, which to me means I like to create things that bring value to people's lives. And so the reason I went into podcasting is because I like podcasts. I enjoy the audio portion of it and the technical aspects. I enjoy the writing that's required for good show notes and that sort of thing. And I also am just kind of a perpetual learner. So it was fairly consistent with my bent to dig in and kind of do a a DIY approach, you know, do it yourself and figure out how to do some of these things and learn things like search engine optimization and how to write a post to rank higher in Google, learned how to do the technical aspects of audio editing and and what makes for a good conversation and how to edit it so that it goes more smoothly and more coherently, all those kinds of things. 
And that was when it was just a one man shop, you know, and I'm, I'm working just with a few clients. I think by the time I had 10 or 11 clients, we had enough to uh, kind of support our family only. But any further beyond that, as we started getting more clients, I had to get help. And so I asked my oldest son if he would like to work for me part time and do some editing and things like that. And he was 23 or 24 at the time. And he said, sure, he would love to do that. Well, he's still with me now. He works full time for me. And he's a great audio editor. He just has a really good ear for how to edit well. And I think some of the biggest struggles have been recognizing, first of all, that deliverables like services or or projects that you're creating for people only come out with the degree of quality and the standard that you want them to come out with if you have a plan for how you're going to get it there. And that means a system or a, a checklist or something that helps you check the quality as you go along. I had an early experience with a fairly big name a client who had a decent podcast and we were working with him and I messed up. I wasn't following a checklist. I was just kind of shooting from the hip all the time and creating his episodes week to week, but I would forget things as we're prone to do as human beings. You know, I wouldn't cross all the T's and dot all the I's and it happened enough that he finally sent me an email and said, you know, we're, we're going to move over and work with this other company because there's just too many little things that are being dropped. And and that was a hard lesson to learn, but it was a valuable one because I learned that you have to have some sort of quality control if you're taking people's money in return for some kind of service. They deserve what they're paying you to get. And so that's where I really started digging into systems and organization and how to, how to work that system to create consistent quality products for clients. And so once we got that in place and figured out how to refine systems and make them smooth, the business really started growing because we could handle more work and we could deliver on our promises and clients were willing to refer. That's a huge thing. And so all that was some of the growth pains. And I think maybe the biggest lesson that I learned was that business really isn't about the money. Business is about the relationships. And I really want to care for the people that we work with and care about their message almost as much as they do. You know, I won't presume enough to say I care about it as much as they do. But I want to be like right behind them, being their cheerleader and, and pushing them along, helping them to produce the content that they're wanting to produce. And, and that care has really paid off. And when you truly care for people, they can tell. Oh, they absolutely and they, can. And they love it. They're loyal. They stick with you and they, the, you know, they'll go through thick and thin with you. And, you know, we've had our ups and downs and some times where we've disappointed clients, but because we've built the relationship, they've stuck it out with us. And, and I'm so glad that, that they did. Customer service is such an important part of any organization. You know, without customers, yeah. you really have no business. But yeah. it's not only about customer service. It's about caring about yeah. the service that you're providing to your customers. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, the way I talk to my team about it quite often, Art, is rather than use the phrase customer service, I refer to customer experience. And by that, I mean, what are they experiencing when they interact with us? It's not so much about the product we deliver. It's about how they feel about our team when we interact with them. Is it just cut and dried business talk or are we really expressing concern for them and care for the outcome and wanting to know their goals so that we can help them meet them? I mean, those kinds of things give them an experience with us that they don't get other places because other places it's often just about the transaction and we want to go beyond that. Yeah, it reminds me, it brings to my, up for me I am big into labels, the labels that people mm. put on themselves because they live up to those labels. Yeah. So if you surround a, an organization with negative labels, if they're going to go in a negative direction, but positive labels go in the positive direction. And, uh, you know, we've done research on it and a lot of things. And one of the things that we found with prisoners in prison was that 90% of them had been told that they were going to end up in jail when they were a child. It's incredible. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I always tell people, be careful of labels. I just got into a big thing. These people call internet marketers and them call their people tribes. And yeah. I don't like the word. I don't know why. I just don't like calling other people part of my tribe. It, it just has huh. been adverse in me. And my clients, a lot of them become almost like family to me. 
So I yeah. call a lot of my yeah. my clients family members. I mean, you know, sure. you're part of my family. I love them dearly. We've gone through a a lot. We've shared a lot, and we've grown a lot. And they've helped me grow. I've helped them grow. And and it's an exchange, just like a family. And, and yeah, I really definitely is. I'm very passionate about it. So, uh, I, one of the other things I don't want to mean to, to switch gears, but I'm going to make a 360. I'm so interested in hearing about Roland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the RV lifestyle, man. This is a crazy turn in our journey that we never expected. It really was only about six months ago or eight months ago. This is, let's see, we're recording in January of 2019. And it was about six months ago, my wife and I started talking about changing the, the way we've lived. We lived in this little town in the middle of Colorado for about 10 to 11 years. Most of our kids had been raised there, at least the, the older parts of their childhood that they can remember. And we, we were at a point where four of our five kids would be out of the home finally, and, and we'd have one still at home. And life's just looking a lot different than it used to look. And it's kind of like the perfect storm. All of these things collided at the same time that made it evident to us it's time for a change. And as we were talking about what that looks like, we both just really liked the idea of selling our house while the market was high. And come to find out after we started investigating, we could do so and make a pretty good profit on it from what we paid for it. And then use the proceeds to get into a brand new RV. And our thinking on it was, we're selling our home. We might as well get a nice one because I, I don't want to don't live in a junker after we're living in our big house all that time. So, so we did. We bought a new RV and uh, we named him Roland because he rolls right down the road, you know, and uh, we, we just love it. We've been in it for two, three months here and are just traveling. I've got five or six speaking engagements around the country throughout the course of the year. So we're just kind of following the trail that leads to all of those events. And right now we are in Tucson, Arizona. We're going to be getting some warranty work done on Roland. But after that, we're going to cross Texas. We're going to head, wind up in Florida where I'm a part of a podcasting conference there. And then uh, from there, back up to Kansas City, over to Portland, across the north and into the Midwest, and wind up over in the East Coast for the fall time. And then for the winter down, probably in the Carolinas for Christmas. And it's, it's just this incredible adventure. And, and we just smile and laugh at each other all the time and, and how crazy this is. We've got so much in common because one of my dreams has always been to have a, a bus. I, I want a bus mm. for some reason. Yeah. I, I, one time, because I live in Austin, we have so many entertainers here. Willie Nelson lived not very far from us and George Strait lived in San Marcos and I knew his bus driver. Yeah. So I got to see their vehicles and, and see those extravagant buses that they travel in. Yeah. And always thought yeah. it would just be such a blast to go. I love people. I love meeting people. And what a way to meet people. And what a way yeah. to share your journey and your life and all that you're doing and in Christ and everything else that happens in our lives, you get to meet so many people because I love meeting people. I mean, that, mm. that is really the thing that motivates me more than anything is I can be in the subway in New York and sit next to somebody. And by the time we leave, I know their life history and they know mine and yeah. we're hugging and <laughs> squeezing be on the way out the door, you know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, you get occasionally, you get that person that goes, you know, stay away from me. You yeah, know? Leave me alone. Yeah. yeah but. Well, Art, you've got a unique gift there. You really do. That's great. That's yeah. great. You know, an interesting story you'll probably appreciate since you like buses so much is the place where I bought Roland is in Fort Worth, Texas. It's called, let me, let me think here. Um, uh, gosh, I know, I know the MH, place. Yeah. MHSRV motorhome <laughs> specialist. And they have, under this canopy back in the back lot, they've got this old style bus sitting there. And I asked the salesman, what's the story on that bus? He said, oh, that's the last tour bus Elvis Presley purchased. Oh, wow. And, and our owner saw it on auction and had to have it. And I don't know why he has to have it. It just sits there. <laughs> so, so I wanted to go and you know take a little tour of the bus, but he never actually arranged that. But anyway, if you ever want to see it, it's a motorhome specialist. Yeah, you can go actually, ask. Actually, I've, I've been up Elvis there. But I've been up there, but I never went back into the back lot to look at it. 
but I've actually seen Dolly Parton's old, her original yeah. bus that she had, which was like a, a 50 something bus. And it was so cool. Yeah. And there was a guy yeah. in Austin that used to collect the entertainers, old buses just to have a collection. And he had, I think he had one of George Strait's original buses. He had one of Willie's original buses. And it was so interesting wow. to the history yeah. and the miles. I mean, some of the, some of the, I think Dolly Parton's bus had like 800,000 miles on it. You know, it was, My it goodness. still ran and you kind of went, wow. Yeah. If the, if these walls could talk, <laughs> you know. Oh, sure. They could. So, well, what's on the horizon for Kerry Green? Well, other than doing a lot of driving over the next year, uh, we are we are working on quite a few different projects. One is in kind of an offshoot of our podcast production service. I'm sure you've heard a lot of the the podcasts that are kind of a higher level of production value, Freakonomics Radio, Masters of Scale, shows like that that have a whole lot of different sounds and interview pieces and sound effects and background noise and ambiance. Uh, we're working to create a service that produces that kind of an outcome for people who uh, work for Fortune 500 companies or large marketing firms, PR companies, so that we can work with them at a distance instead of them having to hire an entire entourage of, of audio professionals and sound designers and script writers. We're trying to put together a workflow that can enable us to do that over a distance so that we can work with them and in a matter of a couple of weeks have a new episode out with that kind of production quality. Um, we've already decided on the name for the company. It's probably going to be an offshoot company. Uh, we're going to call it Narratively and it's going to focus on narrative type interviews where uh, we piece together a story with a narrator and, and sound effects and, and interview pieces and all that kind of stuff. So that's what's on the horizon. Uh, I'm hopeful we'll get it kind of put in place and be doing beta work on it by the end of the first quarter this year. But with the way we're traveling, I don't know if that's going to be possible. We'll give it a try. That sounds really exciting. I mean, that that's an endeavor right there. I mean, Oh, definitely. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Being a new podcaster, and I mean relatively mm. new since December 26th, uh, when my first episode launched, do you have any advice for new podcasters? What would be the piece of it, one piece of advice two pieces of advice <laughs> that you would want to give them. What, what yeah. do you think is important? Yeah, I think the most important thing is that your episodes are packed with valuable things for the people you're trying to reach. Um, it's one thing to record a conversation, but it's another thing to uh, stage or frame that conversation in a way that really brings out value. The listeners that you're able to attract to your show will continue to listen as long as they're getting something out of it. I mean, if you, you think about any product or service, any company that we, we frequent, mm -hmm. that's the story. You keep going back as long as you're getting something of value out of it. But the moment that stops and they start getting the sense that he's just publishing because he needs to publish on Friday and it really wasn't that good, they start getting drawn away. And that's becoming more and more true the more and more podcasts are published just because there's, there's more to choose from. And so people are becoming more selective. They're becoming more picky in what they listen to. And so things like audio quality and production value and, and good conversations all really matter. And so I think a resource that I've come across that I just really love is there's a, a podcast called The Turnaround. And it's a national public radio interviewer who is interviewing famous interviewers like Dick Cavett and Katie Couric and people like that about interviewing. I mean, I mean, how, how meta can you get? But he's had, he's had people like Katie Couric and Dick Cabot and Larry King and, and just all these big name interviewers asking them about the art of interviewing. So uh, you're doing a great job asking questions, Art. You're just real easy to talk to. But I'm sure there's things you could learn there from that podcast that would really help. It's a great podcast for anybody who wants to do an interview style show. Yeah, I'm very much like you. I'm an avid learner. And I love learning. And, uh, you know, being that I'm so new at it, I, I know I have a massive amount to learn. And I care. I really that I mean, my whole purpose, I'd rather not put a episode out and let, if I didn't think it was going to have value to people. Yeah, even saying that, you don't always know how it's going to go. And yeah. guiding it into being very valuable to people is I 
is really important to me. So that mm -hmm. I thank you for, Carrie. I mean, that advice is, uh, I hope, helpful to a lot of people, uh, not only myself, but I'm really blessed that you laid that on me because I, I will take your Well, advice. I appreciate that. I, I will take I your advice. That. You're more, you're an expert in it and I'm not. <laughs> and I'm doing this interview and I consider it a blessing and how we came to do it was interesting. So, but, uh, yeah. So any closing words that you would like to leave with the audience? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I think that what I would say is for too long in my life, I just kind of coasted. And by that, I don't mean that I would, didn't do well at what I did or I didn't pursue it with all that I was. But I didn't recognize that God had gifted me in a way, as he does with every person, where I could take part in my destination and determining what that was to a degree. And that means we're able to do things that can improve our life. We're able to do things that can benefit others. We're able to come up with ideas that that really can change the course of the history of those who are around us in our lives. And since I've been an entrepreneur, I've gotten to see that more, uh, obviously, firsthand. And you would think being in the pastorate, you see that all the time. But being in the pastorate is a different animal in a way. You're kind of in a context where that's expected of you and it's just part of the job description and all of that. But once you get out of that little bubble and you start realizing the people you meet every day are in need of encouragement. They're in need of help. They're in need of, of whatever services you provide. And you don't have to be salesy about, excuse me, you don't have to be salesy about any of it. You just have to be genuine and, and care about people. And so I guess what I would say is I would just encourage people to be, be people who, who are not afraid to look beyond where you are right now and believe that something better can come about. Um, set, your, set your sights a little higher maybe and work and strive. Don't be afraid of hard work. You can really add some incredibly valuable things to the world. Now that's value and what I call a shower epiphany. That is an epiphany that people can use and value to move forward because so many, I agree with you, Carrie, so many people have ideas and thoughts, but they never take action on it. Right. And that's what's important. And that's what the value in what you and I are talking about is to getting people to take action and become doers and doers of good deeds. It really mm -hmm. makes a huge difference in our lives. Carrie, thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Where can people get a hold of you? Your website? Yeah, well, I've got way too many websites. So let me just give you an email address. That's probably the best way to get in touch with me. And the easiest one is probably Carrie. That's my first name, C A R E Y, at Carrie Green, just like the color, dot com. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate it. I'm blessed to have had you on the show. Thank you. Let's wrap it up. Heather White, take it away. Thank you much, Carrie. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.